Welcome to ARC 214, Surviving Success, COVID-19, Blackboard's Black Swan Event. I'm Brian Carlson, the Operational Excellence Lead for the AWS Well Architected Program. And I'm Gavin Llewellyn, Staff Software Engineer at Blackboard. For the title to really make sense, you need to understand what a Black Swan Event is. The concept is, is there is a thing that would not, you would not reasonably be able to predict. But after you've seen it, it makes sense that you should be able to predict it. If you've only ever seen white swans, then black swans seem highly unlikely until you see a black swan and then it seems very reasonable. In the same way, uh, there is nothing in Blackboard's history that would suggest that they should anticipate a order of magnitude increase in their utilization. But with the events that unfolded in 2020, the measures implemented to reduce the global spread of a disease, it makes sense after the fact that it would massively increase the online classroom utilization. So, during that time period, Gavin, exactly how much did your uh, utilization increase? We went up to 50 times our, our typical peak concurrency. And what is it today? More like 90 times. So such a large increase in utilization would be considered a significant DDoS attack if it was in fact a DDoS attack. But in this case, it's completely legitimate traffic. So the AWS Well Architect Framework is a collection of best practices, design principles, and resources that were created in order to enable our customers to make effective and, effic and efficient architectures in the cloud. And operational excellence is one of the five pillars, along with security, reliability, performance, and cost optimization. And I will frequently refer to op operational excellence as OE. So the framework's provided by for free, and there's actually a tool in the console to help you do your own reviews. Now, you can be prepared for the unexpected. Specifically, we're gonna highlight the well-architected best practices and design principles that allowed Backboard to scale to 50 times their expected utilization in an extremely short time frame. There were some hiccups and challenges along the way. And we are going to explore those specifically and look at how Blackboard adapted. So let's take a look at a map of where we're going today. We're gonna to talk about Blackboard. We're gonna talk about their migration to the cloud and the changes they made once they got there. We're gonna look at the events around March, 2020 and forward and look at how Blackboard managed to get ahead of the surge and go from reactive to proactive, finally being able to support a 90 times utilization. So Gavin, who is, uh, who is Blackboard today? Blackboard is a leading education technology company with millions of customers around the world. Our main focus is to make sure education is accessible to everyone everywhere. Our mission is advancing learning in partnership with the world's education community so that all students, educators, and administrators can reach their goals today and prepare for tomorrow. If you've heard of Blackboard before, it's likely because of our learning management system, Blackboard Learn. And what exactly is a learning management system? In EdTech, a learning management system, or LMS, is a tool that supports the administration and delivery of education. Things like how students access instructional content, turn in their homework, interact with peers, check their grades, and engage with their professors. So Learn pulls everything together, but you specifically work on Collaborate. Yes, I've been a Collaborate developer for the past four years with a focus on the component that handles the audio and video streams, which we call the Media Conferencing Unit, or MCU. Collaborate is our web-based platform that cannot connects instructors and learners in a secure virtual classroom, specifically designed for teaching and learning. Instructors use Collaborate to deliver real-time instruction, record lessons for independent viewing, and host interactive discussions with their classes. My son actually uses Collaborate. When he's on his device, he really is in his classroom. It's also one of the few opportunities he has these days to actually spend time and be with his friends. So he's a really big fan, and in a very real way, Collaborate is an extension, a virtual extension of his classroom. So in 2018, you made the determination that you're going to move to the cloud. Can you tell us more? Yes. In early 2018, we were in an on-premises data center with our own homegrown software. Making changes there was slow and complex and very procedure heavy. And we couldn't, orchest we couldn't leverage the standard orchestration tools. And that meant that we ended up with a fixed set of physical and virtual resources. It had to be sized for the worst hour of the worst day that we anticipated. 
We wanted to improve our agility and to be able to scale the system without buying additional hardware. And we wanted to access more powerful virtual machines than we had in our data centers so that we could support things such as larger virtual classrooms. We wanted to do that with a partner with a lot of experience that we, so that we could leverage their world-class support above and beyond what we'd come to expect of our own data centers. And we knew that we could find that with AWS. You were looking for some of the classic features of the AWS cloud. It is a fundamental design principle of well-architected to stop guessing your capacity needs. And the ability to scale elastically and dynamically is part of the best practices in the reliability pillar, the performance pillar, and the cost pillar. You also want to have access to larger instances to scale up to support a larger classroom. By the way, I'm also a big fan of enterprise support. So we set up a dedicated team that we're trying to make that transition as quick and as simple as possible. So as a soft, standard software developer, uh, our engagement with them was primarily about requirements and allowed us to get on with the typical day-to-day -day activities as normal. So we ended up with something that was very closely matching what we had in our on-premises data center, which for a while we ran as a hybrid cloud with expanding MCU capacity into the cloud or retaining databases in our own data center. But today we are almost entirely in the AWS cloud, apart from a couple of VMs that haven't become a priority yet. Having dedicated resources for your migration certainly makes things easier. It doesn't distract from day-to-day -day operations or your development efforts. It also means you end up with a team of people who have the AWS skills to help your future efforts. And that supports an OE best practice of ensuring your personnel have the capability to support your workload. Now, replicating your environment in the cloud is a very common migration pattern. It lets you take advantage of the cloud immediately without much refactoring. So soon after we arrived in the cloud, we were using multiple accounts, which separated our dev and test environments from our production environments. Uh, we were using four AWS regions, which closely matched the locations of our existing data centers. We moved to using multiple availability zones, which added a degree of redundancy, which we didn't have previously. But we still had long-lived virtual machines, which where the software was being managed by Chef. We did manage to introduce scripted scaling of our most expensive component, the MCU. So a Lambda would terminate or just stop some of the instances each evening. Uh, now, in the data center, the MCUs used to write the recording output to an NFS drive. And as we migrated to AWS, that uh, transitioned seamlessly to, uh, to Amazon EFS, which is very similar. Uh, and amongst our fixed virtual machines, we had the recording processing system, or RPS. Yes, very creative naming. Um, and that would pull EFS for these recording artifacts and, and process the recordings once they were available. So here we are taking a look at that specifically. After implementing your cloud uh, multi-account strategy, the first thing you did was you added multiple availability zones to increase that level of redundancy, supporting your availability. And that's actually a reliability best practice. Deploy the workload to multiple locations. Uh, then you implemented time-based scaling of your named MCU instances using a custom Lambda function. Those MCUs, they provide video processing content down to uh, EFS. And then the RPS instances pick that up and do the post-processing. Yep, that's correct. correct. Very good. All right, so after September, which is back to school time, uh, and the pressure of that ending, you made some significant changes. Yes, we wanted to move to CentOS for a while so that we could make use of the latest instance types, such as the C5 at the time. And that upgrade had always been very difficult to do when we were on premises, but became very easy to do by moving to custom AMIs for the MCU. At that point, the instances just needed to pull in some static configuration information from S3 as they started up, which we did via cloud in it. There are both cost and performance best practices to understand the available services and resources and then evaluate them to determine if they provide benefits that merit adoption. You obviously had evaluated the newest instances and found them attractive from a cost and performance perspective? Yes, we definitely had more bang for our buck with the C5s. We were able to move to much larger classrooms on the larger instance. So how large is your largest classroom? It's, it currently supports 500 participants. Of course, customers still want more, and we are getting there. 
So you also have immutable infrastructure with AMIs for the MCUs. And that's safer because you have consistency everywhere. And by not making changes on deployed production resources, you're reducing the risk of failed changes. And that is why deploy using immutable infrastructure is a reliability best practice. Yes, we're using the same AMIs in every region. And then through configuration management, you're picking up the regional uniqueness. And use configuration management systems is also an operational excellence best practice to reduce errors caused by manual changes and processes and to reduce the level of effort to deploy changes. And the other thing that made that easier was deploying those instances through an Amazon auto-scaling group for MCUs. Uh, so we introduced health checks that automatically replaced unhealthy instances instead of needing our SRE team to go in and fix them. And we started using this scheduled scaling uh, that's built into auto-scaling groups to set the minimum capacity based on the time of day. We also moved to introducing a degree of dynamic scaling based on the aggregate CPU metrics from the auto-scaling group. Though at this stage it was quite conservative, we'd set our minimum schedule based on what we anticipated to need. So replacing a custom solution by adopting a service frees up your teams to focus on the stuff that really distinguishes you as an organization, your own uniqueness. And you get the benefits of the development efforts of a dedicated team that are working at scale. So service adoption, often a good choice. With the ASGs, you've satisfied that goal of being able to scale elastically without investing in hardware. It's providing cost and performance benefits and improving reliability through the replacement of those failed instances if they occur. And that's just an example of the operations as code design principle from operational excellence. But you also made changes to RPS. Yes, there was a more significant redesign there that took us from the instance-based processing to a more serverless architecture. So recording events and metadata were then reported via SNS, which triggered lambdas that update state in DynamoDB. When the recording ends, an AWS step function is run, and that prepares and submits a job to AWS batch. And AWS batch manages the job queuing and scaling of the ECS infrastructure to provide the compute necessary to do that post-processing work. It's a performance design principle to use serverless architectures to remove the need for you to maintain physical servers in its appropriate to traditional compute activities. But why did you choose SNS instead of a queuing mechanism like SQS? We realized early on that it was going to be useful to tie in other subscribers to that SNS topic. So now we have a microservice that also consumes those events and updates the status of the recording in the UI for the customer to see. So you've implemented an event-based architecture, and that's perform operations as code again. The majority of the workload activities are implemented in code and are performed in response to events. So that ensures consistent performance at the speed of the events and prevents the introduction of errors from manual processes. That's right. And finally, the recording artifacts, which we used to uh, write to the EFS disk, is now uploaded to S3 instead. And that helped to remove contention problems that we were having with EFS, as well as the need to manage its capacity and provisioned IOPS. Yeah. Understanding the uh, storage characteristics and requirements is a best practice in performance. And your choice of storage method makes sense. It aligns with the characteristics of the data. Your videos are being treated as objects, and S3 is the best uh, solution as a result. So let's take a look at what this looks like. We have auto scaling, increasing your scalability. We have ephemeral MCU instances with immutable infrastructure that give you, gives you consistency and fast recovery from failed instances. You're using S3 uh, to store the objects that are your video. It's got an increase of access. There's no scaling concerns. Uh, then Lambda is capturing the event. SNS is providing notifications. And step functions and batch are starting things off so that the video can actually be post-processed by the RPS. Yep. All right. So, March is back to school in the Southern Hemisphere and another busy time for Blackboard. And it was in March when the World Health Organization made their first really significant statement about COVID. So what you're seeing here at the bottom of the page is a graph of the utilization rates for Blackboard in their Australia region. From the left, you can see there was a consistent baseline through 2019, but the pattern changes in February of 2020. Yes, it was the second week of February when the SRE team recognized that something interesting was happening in the Australia region. 
a load had appeared there that we were accustomed to in other regions, but not there. That change prompted immediate action with SRE scaling out uh, the capacity of the system, particularly the MCU and, and the schedules for the MCU. Effective operations support can compensate when there are unexpected events in your environment, dealing with incidents, etc., and potentially when there are persisting issues in your workload. In this case, your SRE team was adapting to the changing conditions. So in the first week of March, we then saw the Canadian activity double to the previous week. And at that point, SRE was escalating and team leaders were pulling in the resources they felt were ne was needed to deal with it. You had a defined process for event, incident, and problem management, and that's an OE best practice. And you also had a process per alert for each of these things that were observed, and you defined escalation paths, two more OE best practices. In this case, all of the escalations were performed and all of the component owners were engaged. That weekend, we had recognition that this was going to happen everywhere. It was a start of a wave and the AU region was just the leading indicator. So we pulled in experts on the various components from the teams around to collaborate and had those SMEs for all the components in a single room trying to thrash out what we could do. So we stepped through every component trying to figure out what we needed to do to get it to scale to a theoretical end users. So you were trying to determine the required configuration by right sizing, that's a performance best practice, to cope with the anticipated load. Yes, and all that was accumulated in a wiki page on, on scaling and load testing so that we could find it again later. Excellent. It is also a performance best practice to load test your workload and understand how your workload will operate under stress. Uh, but even better, you're performing knowledge management, an OE best practice, tracking the work closely and capturing your procedures or runbooks, another OE best practice, uh, in those procedures. So as needed, they can be repeated or reversed if necessary. Now, our reliability folks will tell you they can get three nines of availability through architecture alone, but to get to five nines, it takes operations. And what that is, is a partnership between the operations teams and the developers to identify potential sources of failure and work to remove them. Getting to five nines is challenging and can be expensive, but performing those exercises to remove sources of failure can be done by anyone and help you reduce your risks. So with component SMEs that understand the operations performance of their systems based on metric baselines, establishing metrics baselines being an OE best practice. It enables a uh, much more efficient and effective response to incidents based on that deeper understanding that they have. Yes, so at that point the SMEs for each component were effectively seconded to SRE and we maintained a war room with SRE, AWS, TAMS and those SMEs to address issues as they were identified. If there was nothing else happening then the SMEs would be monitoring the components that they knew best. At that point, the cross-team interactions were stronger than I'd ever seen them before. So you instituted major incident management or, or crisis management. Uh, all members knew who owned what components, who was responsible for what specific actions, who to contact if they needed help, and if they didn't know, how to figure it out. And then they also knew how they supported other team members and how other team members supported them. Right there, you have five OE best practices related to how your organization is structured. At this point, any barriers to communication have been removed. Everyone's been enabled to take action and escalate as needed. Team members are able to avoid duplication of effort. Individual tasks aren't conflicting with each other or causing impact to other efforts. Effective and timely communications, enabling team members to take action, empowering them to escalate, that's three more OE best practices. Were you making changes right away? Uh, no, we, that's too risky. We tend to leave changes to overnight, so and, and things are quieter. So SRE were fighting fires during the day and then during the evening deploying the changes that were tracked in JIRA, burning the candle from both ends. So next we saw various limit changes that came in, especially once the AWS TAMs got involved. There are service quotas, also referred to as service limits, on AWS services to prevent accidental over-allocation of resources, which could have unexpected costs. Limit management is so important that there's an entire question dedicated, in the re dedicated to it in the reliability pillar. So you reached out to your account team for help. Your enterprise support TAMs recognized the significance of what was going on. They provided an IEM, or an Infrastructure Event Management. It's a support engagement that's usually for pre-planned stuff like a a big release or a large promotion, but in this case, they're they raising it to help you with the emerging conditions. 
And you were accustomed to managing limits previously, but there were differences, right? Yes, we were used to managing things like EC2 instance limits, but we'd never come across API throttling before that point. So the TAMs helped us identify some limits that were getting too hot and helped us make limit increases where necessary. And some of those increases were just done temporarily while we uh, introduced code changes that would permanently address the underlying problem. For instance, uh, our Many of our processors are managers cron jobs on the MCU instances. And once we'd scaled those instances from hundreds to thousands, then the synchronization of those jobs across instances were just hitting the APIs too hard all at once. Awareness, management, and monitoring of limits. That's three reliability best practices right there. It's important to manage simultaneous request volume to ensure all your customers have equitable access to make service requests. And in your own environments, huge volumes of simultaneous requests, they can overwhelm a microservice. So introduction of jitter, or the distribution of requests over time, and retries over time, ideally with some randomness, um, can prevent this from occurring. With Jitter, you don't have to be sized to absorb the surge condition and be left with an underutilized resource. Jitter is your friend. It's cost effective, it increases your reliability, and uh, just by not hurting yourself. And control and limit retry calls, including the use of Jitter, is a best practice in the reliability pillar. So by the second week of March, the Australia and EU regions were growing day by day and hitting new records on usage. We also started having insight from customers telling us that they intended to move their classes entirely online. And surprisingly, we found that the first big hit was going to be on a Sunday of all days, when the Middle Eastern customers were going to be coming online in droves. Either security or reliability are the most important pillar in well-architected. I know this sounds like it's out of context, but it's because I want to highlight that OE is the first pillar in well-architected strictly because it has the first and mo most important question in well-architected. Paraphrased, it says, do you know what you're doing and why? So this starts out with the first two best practices that focus on understanding your, your customer's requirements, evaluating their customer needs. And understanding the requirements and knowing what good looks like is the only way to successfully plan for how you're going to support your customers. So in this case, your partnership with educators and the engagement you have with your customers, especially in the Middle East, let you recognize what was about to happen. Now, what we see here is a graph at the same scale as the prior graph. And you can see the overlap on the left-hand side. Were you right about the Middle East? Yes, we were. Uh, the funny thing was that we used to load test it three times the, the largest load that we expected in, from our production regions. And that Sunday, we hit three times, and we kept increasing day by day after that. So we were preparing for what we considered to be the near-term worst case, and again, exhaustedly review the components and dependencies of our system to try and determine what was going to break. Applying load testing at three times expected load makes good sense. Testing at 50 times or 90 times, not so much. The teams collectively performed failure mode analysis against your architectures and components. At that point, the leadership team started asking for volunteers to perform monitoring outside of their normal working hours. There really wasn't any trouble finding those volunteers. We all knew that uh, we were providing a key service, and without us, there was no classroom. For my son, at least, it's also a degree of normalcy and consistency at a very challenging time. So after performing failure mode analysis, you shifted to the insight you could gain from the performance of individual components. So I and the other volunteers were doing high-level analysis at 4 a.m., observing the first big ramp up of each day to try and determine what was going to go wrong. And then during normal working hours, when our colleagues would come in, we'd meet up and discuss the what we'd observed and, and that, the prioritization for the tasks for the day to try and get fixes in place for the following day. So you're examining the monitoring and observability data to identify anticipated sources of failure. You're prioritizing the most at-risk components so those sources of failure could be addressed. And ideally, they'll be addressed before the risks were realized and could have an impact on your customers. Yes, we we're focusing on system stability with little regard to cost at that point. We were flagging up areas where we thought there might be limits to the scalability, like shared resources across our microservices, and starting to think about how we could remove those limits. 
So we're adding more instances, adding larger instances, introducing instance type diversity. Uh, we added Redis clustering where we previously only had single nodes and added provisioned IOPS to our RDS instances to keep those alive. And we were fixing application stability issues as fast as we could identify them. There was, however, an architectural challenge that was missed in the fair mode analysis reviews, right? Yes, we ran out of IP address space in our VPCs. My first reaction to that was, are we going to have to tear down all of the resources in order to fix this CIDR range? Uh, but thankfully, we were able to add an additional CIDR range, which allowed us to add more subnets across more availability zones. And that allowed us, again, to return to horizontal scaling. And by the end of March, the EU was running at 50 times its typical peak load. So you increased the number of AZs, increasing your expected availability. You applied vertical scaling for resources that were not designed for horizontal scaling. When you were constrained on IP space and, uh, and unable to scale out, you scaled up through vertical scaling. Um, and you did this, you and then addressed the IP constraint by using non-contiguous non CIDR blocks, which is actually a really cool feature of VPC that more people didn't need to know about. It makes it a lot easier to grow. Yeah, during that period, it felt like there were so many issues getting revealed in such a short time, they couldn't all get the attention that they deserved. But from there, the strong growth eased off and gave us some breathing room to consolidate and catch up on some sleep. So let's look at how to survive success. We have challenges, we have solutions. Starting out with that massive increase in utilization, the solution is your people and your architecture. And focusing on the people specifically, you had processes in place to support incident management, although you had not anticipated the scale. Everyone had a clear understanding of what they owned, what they were responsible for, and their part in achieving the customer outcomes, all supported by organizational structure. And Blackboard's internal culture empowers individuals to take action and escalate as they see fit when they think there's a risk. And beyond that, you had very effective communications. So that makes everything better. And in this case, uh, the most important example is probably when SRE escalated in response to that change in user behavior in the Australia region. That started the response before you're overwhelmed. And beyond that, your team members are really invested in making sure education is accessible to everyone everywhere. Your, let's see here. Now, what might break? Well, you monitor to gain insight to at-risk components. And after performing failure mode analysis, you use those insights to remove sources of failure. And constrained as you were, you were doing the optimal response available to you at the time with very little realized customer impact. And then you dealt with the capacity issues through limit increases, horizontal auto scaling, uh, manual vertical scaling, using instance diversity to right size, uh, provisioning IOPS to get the maximum performance available, and caching. And let's take a look at what that looks like. So we start out with instance diversity, and then vertically scaling your microservices, identifying which ones needed to be bigger. Uh, you increased the IP space and AZs to increase the scale of horizontal scaling you could support. Uh, you provisioned IOPS to maximize available throughput of your RDS instances, and you increased the size of your many caches that you have in your architecture to support increased load. Now, September's back to school, that happened, and when the majority of your users become active. The additional growth from 50x to 90x, it really wasn't that much of a concern because of the work you did over the summer, or was it? Uh, yeah, it was a, a lot more relaxed. We were able to reestablish the normal development release cycles over the summer and spend some time further enhancing our metrics, monitoring, and alerting. So there's always more work to be done there. So I know Slack has always been a big part of the community and communications across Blackboard teams, as it has Collaborate. Uh, and I know you've added alerts and notifications to Slack, creating a chat ops kind of thing. Yes, we are getting that. And the other thing we introduced was predictive auto-scaling of our MCU auto-scaling group. So that AWS service analyzes the last two weeks worth of CloudWatch metrics and predicts what's going to be needed over the coming days and sets an hourly schedule to provide that capacity. That also contributes to cost optimization, but that's not all you've done in that space. 
Yes, the main focus for cost optimization has been the MCU, which is the most expensive part of Collaborate. Now, while we're still largely homogenous, we have introduced further instance type diversity, which has given us the flexibility to introduce spot instance usage. Now, with spot, we are typically saving about 50 to 60 percent compared to the normal cost of an on-demand instance. And, but we do need to be aware that we can lose one of those instances with as little as two minutes warning. Thankfully, we've designed it so that we can migrate all of the load off of an MCU within those two minutes onto other MCU instances with negligible impact on the customer experience, often going completely unnoticed. Having that fault tolerance is a huge achievement and very impressive, but using Spot is more typical when there's a queue or a buffer in place where multiple resources are working independently to process requests. That is true, and we first introduced Spot with our AWS batch processing system where interruptions had far less impact. So let's look at what that looks like. Well, these are the improvements you've made. You have predictive auto-scaling, so that capacity matches the predicted need. You have Spot instances in use with MCU and RDS, reducing cost and leaving you with consistent performance. And you've added the Latin America region. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, Elasticache. You've increased the size of your clash, cache, added clustering, and now you can support additional reliability. And you've added Latin America so you can support more customers. Your people and processes were always good, and perhaps they're better for the experience, even if they're tired. But from where you started, primarily as named resources, transitioning work tasks to a event-driven uh, architecture with significant serverless components, that's, uh, that's quite the evolution with very strong scaling capabilities. So what we're going to look at in a moment is four graphs representing the relative increase in utilization for Blackboard across their four regions. Uh, it begins in January and goes through to October, and the Australia region that we've been focusing on will be the one on the bottom. Now you can see the doubling of utilization when the SRE team raised the alert uh, down there in February, and that's sort of the process that enabled Blackboard to scale and support its customers. It is possible that the actions of the Blackboard SRE team are what allowed the, uh, Blackboard to ramp up in time and get the head of the curve. Uh, it's interesting to, how stressful that first increase to 50 times was compared to the, the later increase to 90 times. Looking at the chart, they both look equally scary. But with everything we learned the first time around, that was uh, only made us mildly nervous. So after all that, have you had a chance to celebrate? Uh, unfortunately, no. COVID has put the kibosh on that one for now. Have you got to at least relax? Uh, I definitely find ordinary software development more relaxing than the fighting fires we had been doing back then. Okay then, what's next? Uh, well, now that we can breathe, we've had a renewed focus on features, and the feature I'd call out that we're working on is called Gallery View. So at the moment in the virtual classroom, you can only see four videos, and we're currently working to expand that, but perhaps as high as 25. We're also exploring further cost optimization, and the main focus for that has been the new Graviton 2 type instances, so the C6G, which is looking very promising. And of course, we'll be reviewing the best practices from Well Architected to make sure that we're ready for whatever comes next. And speaking of those best practices, we got some resources for you. There is always the AWS Well Architected Framework site where you can find uh, content specific to the pillars and content to the framework overall. There's also lenses, which are specific views that are technology or domain specific. Beyond that, we have the Well Architected Labs. They're an open source resource available to you on GitHub, where you can do some self-guided learning that where you get to exercise those best practices and design principles. And there's the AWS Architecture Center, where all these things are pulled together, including the AWS Solutions Library, where you can find prepared for you, well-architected solutions that are common patterns. And they're an excellent place to find something, try it out, and maybe launch your own uh, implementation from there. Once again, I've been Brian Carlson, the Operational Excellence Lead for the AWS Well-Architected Program. And I'm Gavin Llewellyn, a Staff Software Engineer for Blackboard. Thank you for attending our session, and 
please complete the session survey. We'd love to hear what you think and know your thoughts.